All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alex Creighton, and I'm here from the core team for Rust. I'm actually traveled all the way up from San Francisco just for this one event, just to talk with you guys. <laughs> Awesome. Well, so today I'd like to tell you a little bit about the state of Rust today and kind of where it's going in terms of how, where, where have we come from since the 1.0 in 2015? What are we currently doing right now? And kind of what's on the near horizons for kind of early 2015 or late 2016 and kind of what, what goes beyond that. So first thing is, hooray, Rust is one, point, is one year old. It was released on May 15th last year, so it's, I guess, a little bit past that by this point. And Hugh and Wilson actually uh, collected a lot of these really awesome numbers. So if you see this, ever since 1.0, this is not uh, like accounting the 1.0 statistics, we've had almost 12,000 commits with over 700 contributors. And that's actually an astonishingly large amount, because if you, think it, if you take a look at the numbers for before 1.0, I think we had almost 1,000 unique contributors up to that point. And this was the many, many years driving up to that. And this is just one year after that. So this is clear that the steam behind Rust is not abating anytime soon. There's still tons of enthusiasm. There's still tons of effort actually going forward and pushing this project forward. We've had 88 RFCs merged. This is an insane number of RFCs. We have a week-long final comp period for RFCs nowadays. And this map stole out, I think, uh, like two RFCs a week-ish, if you consider like, the times where we're actually merging RFCs. That's an incredible rate of change for a language which has been incredibly stable this entire time. This is also really representative of how we're always willing to take new ideas. We're always willing to kind of keep pushing the language forward, keep pulling in community ideas, and kind of keep refining what we currently have. In addition to all that, we have all these new targets. Oh, I think we had like six at 1.0. We have 18 new ones now. It's crazy how uh, you can see Rust running in so many more places nowadays than you could at 1.0. And we've delivered nine releases. I think we released 1.9 uh, like a couple of weeks ago at this point. And of course, we've delivered one year of stability. Kind of one of the true promises of Rust at 1.0 was you no longer have to update all your code literally every night. You can now you can, you can take your 1.0 code and be pretty confident that it's still compiling today. Another thing we've seen in uh, Rust since, since 1.0 is this massive uptake of Rust in production as well. So we have this new page, uh, Friends at HTML, on the website. And if you take a look at that, you'll see a, actually a huge number of companies that are using Rust in production today. And each of these has their own story associated with them. And you know, you, like, I would certainly encourage you to go take a look, see if you recognize a few, or if you know anyone, you can feel free to open an issue and, and let us know ourselves. But it's kind of, it's been very humbling to see this small project go and flower in so many different companies over, over this time and, and in ways that we never really imagined. Every time we see these tweets or Hacker News comments or anywhere on the web, people keep mentioning, oh yeah, I just happened to ship Rust in production the other day. I just happened to re replace my one little microservice with Rust. And it's crazy how you keep seeing that all the way after a year. And, you can actually, and it's all only uh, taking up since then. So we had a blog post, uh, I think it was late 2015, that was talking about our focus after 1.0. And it kind of had these three pillars, these three key points of branching out, which is taking, taking Rust far more places than it could go before and making sure that it runs just as well literally everywhere. We have this doubling down, which is saying that we have all this infrastructure, we have all these current investments, and let's kind of make sure we flush them out entirely and kind of reap the full benefit from all that. And finally, we have this zeroing in where we have these, we have a lot of language features, but there are some gaps in them. So a lot of times it goes maybe 90% of the way there, but this is really filling in that final 10%. This is really kind of going all the way with all, each of these language features we'll see. And so these are kind of like the three broad areas I'm gonna talk about during this talk of how Rust has been progressing. And the first of which, is we, we now have Rust everywhere. We can put Rust on so many devices all over the place, and it's kind of amazing how we've seen uh, the progression since 1.0. So, so uh, one of the biggest things we've seen here, which I don't really tend to consider in terms of running Rust all over the place, is this whole idea of embedding Rust in another language. This is a very unique property of Rust, which you can only do with essentially C or C++, and even, and even those are somewhat difficult sometimes. So we've seen these a couple of awesome projects actually doing this. So the first of which is called Neon on the side. This is run by uh, Dave Herman, I believe, at Mozilla. And the, the concept of this is that uh, you write uh, your Rust code. It's all totally safe. And then all of a sudden, you can now call that from Node.js. And one of the uh, most difficult parts about embedding Rust in another language is this whole idea that you're have to, having to talk over FFI, which is a very unsafe boundary. A lot of uh, restrictions there. You've got to make sure you follow Rust's rules as well as Node.js's rules. But the idea of uh, Neon, and this is the same thing as Helix, which is for Ruby, is to kind of eliminate all of that. All of these pitfalls you, you would a might run into otherwise, you can kind of square that all away and kind of get that translation cor layer correct once, and you don't have to worry about it from then on. 
So this is part of Rust's idea of bringing systems programming to the masses, where if you're working in Node.js or you're working in Ruby and you've always wanted to get uh, the most performance out of your little tight loop or the most performance out of some other part of your application or maybe some more portability, you can now lower down to Rust without even having to worry about unsafe code. You can just stay in completely safe Rust the entire time and you truly are guaranteed no seg faults. There's not this little caveat saying that on the very edge you have to worry a little bit. And not only that have we seen this in new languages, but we've actually seen this embedded in new engines today. So if you run Firefox today, you're running Rust code. There is Rust code in Firefox stable. It's currently a pretty small portion that's only parsing, uh, I think, the MP4 metadata coming off of images, but we're, we're seeing this massive uptake. There's actually a project inside of Gecko right now to take Servo's style sheet engine and put it in, in Gecko itself. This is a massive component that's all going into Gecko, and it's kind of enabled with these properties that Rust have of no runtime, it's zero cost FFI, it runs just as many places as you would expect Gecko to run places. So this is kind of uh, some awesome projects that we've seen in terms of actually embedding Rust in other, in other languages. But there's always been this kind of weird problem with Rust when you embed somewhere else. So Rust has this uh, macro called panic. And what panic essentially is, is kind of a, a bit of a structured exception, not quite like C and C++ exceptions or other exceptions in other languages, but kind of destroy what you're currently doing all the way to some isolation boundary per se. And this happens in the way we implement it today is via stack unwinding. So whenever you do a panic, we'll actually unwind the stack, we'll run a bunch of destructors, we'll come down to the bottom, we'll catch that exception and then probably exit the program and print something out and do something fancy there. But the problem is that this whole unwinding the stack idea is undefined once you enter a C program. So if you kind of, if C calls into you, you then call some Rust code and then it panics and you try and unwind back down, you're probably gonna seg fault, you're probably gonna have serious problems, you're certainly not portable across various platforms. So uh, this has always been true with Rust today and at 1.0 this was certainly very true. So your only real option was actually anytime C called into you was you spawn a thread, which was the current isolation boundary at that point, or you just pray that panics don't die, or do weird linker hackery to make sure it all works out. But uh, this is basically a kind of uh, area of Rust that wasn't quite filled out just yet. We had a lot of ideas of where to go, but we hadn't quite done it just yet. But ever since 1.9, I think, we have the new std panic module. And the crux of the std panic module is this new function called catch unwind. And this is just a fancy way of saying, given a closure, which can execute once that returns a value, will then return you something saying it might have succeeded or it might have failed. And so this, the failure case here is the panicking case where you can kind of recapture that payload of what the actual panic was. And then this little plus unsafe, uh, unwind safe is actually this bound in this function which took not one but two RFCs to get through. There was a huge amount of discussion about this. And the whole idea is that Un catching exceptions is not exactly a very safe operation to do. There's tons of bugs that this kind of derives from in C and C++. It's this whole idea of exception safety where once you've caught an exception, you don't actually know that you can continue because someone might not have expected the exception to go on. Really needs to say it's relatively complicated, but this unwind safe bound is essentially saying that this is a safe function in Rust and it's kind of a, foot, a, a speed bump saying, you have to think about, like, oh, by, the, by default, you don't have to think about this where it's kind of implemented for some natural types like references or when you move values in there. But for the cases where you do have to worry about it, you might have to kind of, it, the compiler will tell you exactly this variable might be exception safe. You might have to go and kind of reassure to yourself that you're actually dealing with kind of a lot of the pro uh, common problems that come up in exception safety. And another big thing about this is that although we have added this, which is incredibly useful in FFI, so like you no longer have to spawn a thread, you can kind of transmit this information that you panicked to another thread, or to, to back to your original application, this is not a shift in Rust's error handling. So Rust has historically always done error handling through results, which is just an enum saying you're either okay or an error and you have one or two variants. And this is, uh, this is still the idiomatic way to uh, handle errors in Rust. You'll notice, uh, I'll talk about this in a second, where it doesn't actually quite work in all, in all modes, but essentially uh, this is not a new control flow construct. This is only kind of a new building block for these applications which needed it originally but didn't quite have it. And one of the cases this doesn't work is this whole new idea of when you panic, instead of unwinding the stack, you actually abort. And so a lot, of place, a lot of times you're not actually sure whether you can recover from an error that happens. So panics are like index out of bounds or you tried to unwrap a none object or you don't really actually, you might not even know what happened. It's buried in some library where you're not really sure what state you're in. So continuing at that point isn't always desired and that's kind of one of the uh, big points of panicking, of unwinding exceptions is that you can, you can tear down to an isolation boundary and then move forward, but that isolation boundary might not always exist.
And so another thing is that you can't always implement unwinding the actual stack unwinding. So even if you know that boundary, you could be in, for example, a kernel where there's not really an easy way to write a stack unwinder in a kernel, or maybe some new very embedded board where there's not really a nice way to have a stack unwinder. And then not only that, if you, uh, uh, the way that panicking exceptions work is that every time you call a function, if that function call you then panicked, there's kind of a section of code that describes what to do if that panicked. So then when you unwind the stack, you kind of run all these little sections of code. But this is stuff we have to generate. This is stuff we have to say like, oh, run the destructors for those variables and then kind of go back to the next stack frame and continue that. And we've actually witnessed that if you don't emit these, which you don't need if you're just aborting the program, you don't have to unwind, you can actually get 10% faster compiles as well as 10% faster binaries. And these are, these are no small numbers. So this is a uh, kind of a new shift in Rust in terms of uh, filling out a feature we've had before, and we've always intended to implement this, but this is now fully implemented, and I think it's going to be stabilized in 1.10 coming out relatively soon. So this is uh, very suitable for any application which uh, either cannot recover from panics, wants to kind of, kind of get a little bit of a boost in compile times where you don't benefit from recovering panics, or uh, just can't implement panics at all. And so I, I was also saying we have a massive number of targets. So speaking of taking Rust in more places, at 1.0 we had six targets. We had 32 and 64 bit of OS X, Linux, and Windows. And nowadays, I think when I checked this, there was 30, and I'm pretty sure we have like three more since then. So we have an absurd number of targets that we can compile for nowadays. We're only limited by what LLVM can target, and LLVM can target a lot of platforms. And some other shifts we've seen is that MSVC, one of the major tool chains on Windows, is now a tier one platform. It didn't even exist at 1.0, and so we've seen there was a massive amount of popularity on Windows and a lot of uh, desire to have this tool chain, and we have that now fully implemented. And a cool statistic I pulled was we were uploading four and a half gigs of data every night. These are just tarballs of the standard library and the compiler itself. Four and a half gigs every night for all these platforms you see at the bottom and even more. I couldn't list them all because this would just be one giant black slide. But now, once we have all these targets, we had this problem of well, how do we actually give them to you? We have all this great support. So you have very simple questions sometimes like how do I build a static binary? This is kind of a great aspect of some other languages, but I want to do the same thing in Rust. I want to build one thing and ship it all a bunch of times. And it turns out nowadays uh, we have this new tool called RustUp, which makes this really, really simple. So in these five lines of code, some of which, which can actually be mostly omitted, this is downloading RustUp, adding a new target to the compiler, compiling that, and you're done. There really is no third step here. There's no extra step. This is kind of a push button scenario where you just add a target and you're done. So the whole concept of RustUp is that it is a tool chain manager where you can kind of add the stable channel, the beta channel, the nightly channel, the Rust compiler. It'll update them. You can add new targets to these channels. It'll kind of manage everything for you via, if you're familiar with RBN or RVM or NVM, kind of those suite of tools where they multiplex on multiple versions underneath them, this is the idea of RustUp itself. But once we go a little bit farther here and we say, all right, what if I actually want to compile for Android now? I want to have a true cross-compilation cross scenario where I'm compiling. It's kind of hard to run the, the Rust compiler on Android itself, so let's compile for it. So we'll try the same thing again, where we'll just add a target and we'll try and build for it. But we get this really weird error saying we can't actually link with this thing called CC. And what this is indicative of is that you actually need a lot of extra tools for compiling to Android itself. There's this whole thing called the Android NDK, and this is giving you a lot of system libraries, a linker, a lot of other kind of various small utilities you might need along the way, and this is required to actually uh, cross-compile for Android itself. So RustUp currently assumes that you're the one managing this, but this is within RustUp's uh, horizon of actually solving this as well. It's intended that RustUp is going to come along, and when you, when you actually add the ARM target, RustUp will automatically say, I, didn't, I did not detect the NDK. Would you like me to install it? And then would you like me to configure cargo? Would you like me to configure everything along the world? So basically, these two lines are all we're going to need eventually. And the whole Android cross-compilation scenario is not the only one. You can take basically any host target pair, for example, Windows to Linux, or Linux to Windows, Mac to Windows, or uh, there's Mac to Linux, I have more in there. But all of these uh, specific situations, we can have very targeted scenarios saying, you didn't have this package, would you like me to install it? And kind of assist you along the way of doing all these nice cross compilations, which in the past have been very, very difficult to, to actually perform. If any of you have ever cross compiled C to any one language here or there, it's, it's a huge pain just getting all these compilers in place, getting all these libraries in place. And then Cargo is uh, kind of taking care of the other half of this, where it actually plums through all the information and then supports all cross-compilation.
So with these two together, uh, we're not only actually supporting Rust on all these targets, but we're actually putting power in your hands to run Rust on all these targets. And we're not requiring you to read 30 blog posts and download 30 things and put them all in just the right order so they work. And so it's really just you, you issue one command and you're all of a sudden ready to go and you just go and say what you actually need to do. So the next thing I want to talk about uh, is kind of this doubling down on infrastructure. So this, uh, this is apparently one of the Mir mission patches to the Mir space station. If it's not, well, Google had it up, so it's fine. So uh, first, what is Mir, this, this concept of Mir? It's unfortunately not a space station, but today in the compiler, we're kind of a standard, pretty, a pretty standard compilation pipeline where you take the Rust source code, you parse it, you get an AST, which we call a here, and then you do some, a bunch of static analysis, and at the very end, you translate to LLVM, and then from LLVM, you generate a bunch of machine code. Yes? Uh, wasn't it activated, I think, yesterday or today? Not yet. Not yet? But I'll get to that. Okay. So, um, I think I, I saw something in the uh, merge queue, so. It's, it's, it's certainly on its way. <laughs> so what Mir is essentially doing is it's breaking up the static analysis portion where instead of going straight from this AST all the way down to LLVMIR, which is a very high level representation down to very low level representation, this is kind of inserting something in the middle. And what, the, what Mir is going to do is kind of enable us to delay some static analyses until after we have the Mir itself. And it might sound kind of odd as to why we're doing this. So, but a lot of the benefits we're going to get out of this are faster compile times. We're going to be able to, at the mirror level, implement optimizations that can eliminate a lot of code. So you can actually get straight up faster compile by having this extra layer of abstraction. Not only that, but faster execution times. These optimizations, we just can't implement on the AST itself. And implementing them in trans, or the way we actually generate code today to LLVMIR is incredibly difficult and makes it almost essentially po impossible to maintain after that point. So not only get faster compiles, but faster run times, which is something that Rust is already really good at. And then these other, uh, by delaying these static analyses until after we create the mirror itself, I'll show you a couple examples of how we even get more precise type checking, more precise borrow checking, kind of these really nice uh, properties we wanted, we've had kind of the easy things you run into are like kind of the first bugs you see in Rust and you open an issue and we're like, oh, it's known, don't worry about it. The mirror is actually going to solve a lot of these problems. And finally, by having a new layer representation, it gives us a lot of engineering benefits. So this one transition is unlocking all of these steps, and we have a massive number which are uh, queued up right after it as well. So we've been intending to have this kind of refactor on the compiler for quite some time now. So this is just the beginning of the benefits that we're going to be able to reap from Mir itself. So I'm going to show you an example of uh, what Mir is actually doing. Kind of the core goal of Mir is to simplify Rust as much as possible. So if we take a look at this very simple, just an iterator over a vector and then run a function on every element. There's actually a lot of stuff going on here that we'll see. So the first thing that we can do is we can probably eliminate this for loop. What this is actually doing is it's taking the iterator, it's then actually converting it to an iterator, and then it's calling next a bunch of times and iterating over that and actually running, and running the function on every element. But even this is somewhat complicated. Now, we used to have for loops and while loops and loops, but now we have while loops and loops. So there's two different constructs to do loops for. So why don't we eliminate that? We can get rid of while loops entirely. And in this case, we'll just expand that to a loop with a match and a couple of breaks in there. So we can see the, the code is starting to inflate a little bit. But from the compiler's perspective, this is actually getting much, much simpler over time. So we've eliminated a couple of constructs already. But even here. This dot notation where we're calling methods is actually pretty complicated, and there's a lot of stuff going on there as well. So what we can do is we can expand that as well. This is something that in Rust we call it UFCS, or function call syntax. But this is essentially saying that we know exactly what function we're calling. We know exactly what the arguments are, exactly what the receivers are. And we don't need to, there's no extra fluff here. You kind of know exactly what's happening. So not, we, not only have we limited for loops and while loops, we've now also limited method calls. Now this is getting to become relatively unreadable Rust, so you probably wouldn't be writing this anytime soon. But from the compiler's perspective, this is what the analyses actually have to always take into account. This is all, all of these layers of indirection keep going. And it goes further too. So now uh, we have two control flow constructs. We have this loop and we have this break, which are two different ways to kind of re uh, move control flow to another part of the program. So we can go this even farther and say that we don't even have loops and we don't have breaks. All we have is go-tos. So this is starting to breach into the realm of you can't even write this in Rust. Rust doesn't actually have an arbitrary go-to statement. And the point of this is that we're kind of simplifying Rust so much, it's actually becoming somewhat unsafe where you can't write it directly. But it's always coming from a safe, kind of safe roots that you would expect. And then we're also getting out of 
control flow in general in terms of actual brace languages and kind of uh, those kinds of scopes. And essentially what this is doing is it's creating a control flow graph. So if those of you who have implemented anything in compilers or worked in compilers recently, you'll, you'll certainly be familiar with the idea of a control flow graph. But what's going on here is it's saying uh, we're breaking up our program into certain nodes in a graph and then we're going to have edges amongst them saying how you're actually flowing amongst it. So in this case, we started out by creating an iterator. We then transitioned to the loop header where the condition of this loop was saying, all right, we're going to look at the iterator. We're going to say where the, whether we're the sum or the none case. If we're sum, we're going to process our element and go right back, try the next one. And if we're none, we're breaking out of the loop. So this is just a simplified representation inside the compiler itself. And you'll find that a lot of uh, compiler algorithms or compiler optimizations nowadays are based on control flow graphs rather than the original AST itself. And not only that, but it's much easier to understand the control flow in a control flow graph because it's essentially what it's uh, designed to model. So a lot of the uh, associated static analyses in Rust become much, much easier to implement because you just understand, you have a much better, the compiler has a much better knowledge of what's actually happening under the hood. So this, uh, what, are we, what we're talking about with match is actually also still kind of complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on here. We're matching, we're kind of looking at the discriminant of the value to see whether we're sum or none. And then if we are sum, we're gonna pull something out and actually work with it. So we can switch this, we can make this a little simpler by saying, uh, we'll actually tease this out. So we, instead of saying we kind of bind at the same time, we actually just switch directly on the discriminant. And then once we've actually selected in the sum case, we're gonna try and cast it as sum and then pull out that inner value. So this is definitely not Rust. You could never write this in Rust and it's incredibly unsafe in terms of if you just arbitrarily generated this. But you can kind of see from the compiler's perspective, this is getting even more simpler, but it's retaining the original uh, kind of meaning of the, of the code uh, from the first part. And uh, one awesome thing which is going to fall just directly from this sort of translation, directly from this abstraction, is if anyone here before has written Rust where you want to uh, look up a value in a map, and if it's not there, you want to insert it. You'll say match map.lookup value, and if it's none, you try and insert it. But the problem is the compiler thinks that while you, after that match, you actually borrowed something from that map during, that, during the entire scope of the match. So you can't insert while you've borrowed from it because that would be a, a mutable conflict. But here, the compiler has much more precise knowledge saying that only in the sum case do we actually have any borrow into this map. So only right here can we actually say uh, you can't insert during like the actual process closure, but at this none case, we know that there's nothing from the map itself, so we can continue inserting into that. So that's kind of an example of uh, some of the optimizations and kind of more precise type analysis or borrowing analysis that we'll be able to do once we've simplified the language this much. And one of the final things I want to talk about with Mir itself is this whole concept of drop. So in Rust, uh, you always have deterministic destruction, which means that once a variable goes out of scope, you run its destructor and you know precisely when it actually runs out of scope. So in this case, this is our uh, control flow graph from before. We created our iterator. We pulled out the next value. We took a look at it. And if we're sum, we're going to run some code and go back. But if we're none, this is the key thing where this iterator value we, ha we had from before, the iterator is going to go out of scope at this point so we explicitly drop it. This is a pretty big change from the AST today and how trans works, which is drops are always implicit in your source code, but in kind of the way the compiler needs to understand this, they're very explicit. So in, in Mir, we actually literally say we have to run the destructor right here and then you can't access it after that. But there's also this other aspect to drops, which are the panics I was talking about earlier in terms of panic equals abort and all that fun stuff, which is that every single one of these function calls actually has another edge coming out of it. So the first iter each one of these can panic, in which case you have to clean up all local variables and kind of keep going. So when we first create the iterator, if that, if that panics, we don't actually have any local variables. So there's nothing we need to clean up. So we just jettison ourselves in the function itself. But the next one, once we actually call the next method on the iterator, if that panics, we have to clean up the iterator. So we enter a block where we say clean up the iterator and then we keep going. And it's the same for our processing function. If that panics, we have to clean up the iterator. So this is kind of showing how drop is very explicit in the control flow graph, where even on the panic edges and in the normal edges of normal control flow, we have to explicitly say when we're actually dropping this value. And drop is a pretty interesting thing in Rust sometimes. So we have this notion of drop flags right now, which is if you consider a function like this where you uh, take some data, and if some condition is true about that data, you send it off to another thread, and you run some other stuff. So in Rust, you cannot use this data value after the if, after the if block. It's been, it could have been moved out. You don't actually know if it has. So at, syntactically, you're disallowed from actually using that. 
But from the compiler's cogen point of view, what's going to happen is the destructor for this vector is going to run perhaps on the other thread, which has then moved ownership to it, or locally after the post send function when it actually falls out of scope. So we have these two places where we might have to run destructors. And the way that Rust implements this today is actually kind of relatively inefficient, where once you move the data out, it just paves over it, the local variable, with a, with a bit pattern saying, I've been moved out, you can't run me, you can't run a destructor here. And then so when we actually attempt to run the destructor at the end, we'll kind of check and it won't, it won't be correct and we won't actually run the destructor, or it'll be valid and then we actually do run the destructor. So if we take a look at this as a control flow graph itself, we'll see we have this if block. If it's true, we send it to another thread. If it's false, we then run our other stuff, drop it, and return. And so and not, an easy optimization here, you might be thinking, is why are we paving over this entire value? Why are we kind of writing all this information in here? What if we just had this idea of a stack flag, a little kind of tiny byte on the stack saying whether this is currently owned or not? And if we take a look at a control flow graph for that, we'd essentially say, at the very beginning, we own data. So we have our stack flag that says we actually own it. If the condition is true, we'll send it off to another thread, and then we'll say we no longer own this value. Our stack flag will say false. And then once we come down to the very end, we'll uh, run our final code. But when we're supposed to drop, we actually have a condition here saying, if it's still owned, we go run the destructor. But if it's not owned, we just skip it directly. So this is uh, not implemented. To, oh, actually, <laughs> this wasn't implemented to when I wrote these slides. But I think as of two days ago, this is actually implemented in Mir now. And this is a massive optimization in terms of actual runtimes of Rust code itself. So if you compile with Mir, you'll probably actually see some speed ups in your just raw, like your code as is. And the reason for this is LLVM can see through these, op these stack flags way better than it can through paving over a value, writing it somewhere with some random bytes, and kind of understanding that that was a, a, a saying you shouldn't actually run it as the drop later. And there's some pretty trivial optimizations we can do here as well, where today we always do this paving of writing a new value. But instead, if I just moved, like if, if we didn't have this condition, if we just always ran straight to setting the data to the thread, you can say this if data is owned is always false. So we can actually totally eliminate the entire basic block saying drop of data. And that is kind of the key to many other optimizations. So you can, uh, this is kind of opening up the world for mere optimizations and kind of processing all this information before we hit LLVM. So the next, the final thing that I want to talk about is uh, the uh, doubling down on key infrastructure, or I'm sorry, doubling down on the uh, features that we have in Rust today. So I specifically am going to talk about async IO and features. And any of you who have seen Back to the Future, it was an awesome movie. And if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend seeing it. So taking a look at the kind of the IO world today, you'll have the APIs in STUD. You have STUDFS, you have STUDNet. They're all blocking APIs. They basically just say, read some data, block my thread. And once that actually comes in, you'll tell me how much was actually read in. And if you actually put these on Unix, these uh, primitives in non-blocking mode, then you'll just get an error from the API saying it would block. And that's kind of the end of our async IO support in the standard library today. We give you the kind of the core fundamentals to actually build this up, but then we say it's up to you to actually do anything with it. And this has the consequence that if you want to do really simple operations, like accept a socket but with a timeout, or wait for a read or a write to finish, it's actually really difficult to do this. And this is kind of what the crux of what async IO is supposed to solve. You, I execute a bunch of operations, you then figure out what's, what's finished, and you can uh, progress from there. So the state of the art today of asynchronous IO and Rust itself is this library called MIO, which stands for Metal IO. And what it, mean, what it is doing under the hood, it's a very thin wrapper around the ePoll syscall on Unix and the KQ syscall on the BSDs and OSX. And all that is really saying is uh, Mio kind of queues up a bunch of stuff, and then it says, dear kernel, what happened since I last asked you, asked you what happened? And it'll give you a bunch of events saying, this, was, this is readable, that's writable, this, can be, this has an error on it. Or it'll block until anything does happen. So this is a very efficient way of having a lot of concurrent IO events all at once, and you can then process all of those and efficiently query the kernel saying what's actually going on. And this is also supported on Windows, but unfortunately the model on Windows is radically different to that on Unix. So in Unix, you ask the kernel, until when can I do some work? And then when it's ready, you do the work. Whereas in Windows, it's you do the work, and then the kernel tells you when it's done. So these two, they sound relatively similar, but they end up having to be implemented in entirely different ways. So the Mio title of Metal I.O. is not quite as metal on Windows, but there is an implementation of Mio on Windows, so we have cross-platform support there. It just, there's a little bit more of an abstraction on Windows. 
And we've seen that uh, this Mio crate has become the foundation for asynchronous I.O. throughout the ecosystem today. So you'll see a lot of crates that are based on async I.O., a lot of event loops. All of this is kind of has Mio at its heart, and Mio at the core where uh, being cross-platform and now it can actually run everywhere. And it's, it's got that very thin layer for the very performant use case of, for example, having Linux servers. You don't have to worry about this extra abstraction once you go down that far. The problem with Mio, though, is it's kind of hard to write. So this is the echo server, and I don't know if you can read that because I certainly can't. But this is just a simple way of saying, read some, like accept a socket, read some data, and then write the data byte back out to it. It's really complicated, and this is not a problem, this is not a problem with Mio, this is just a problem with ePoll. Running at that level, running at that layer, and kind of having that level of abstraction is very difficult to work with. So clearly, we need a better thing here. We need a better library. We need something to work with Mio for us, and then we can then build our abstraction on top of that. And if we take a look around at what exists today, uh, first you'll probably find Eventual, which is a thread-safe futures library. And if you look a little farther, you might find MioCo, which is uh, coroutines based on uh, or coroutines based on Mio itself. This is very similar to the old green runtime in Rust, the multi or green threads and based on libuv. It's kind of a, a very similar concept. You'll also find GJ, which is I think the foundation of IO and Captain Proto itself. And this is very similar to Eventual, except it's single threaded instead of uh, threaded. And then uh, once you look outside of Rust itself, you'll also find that there's uh, frameworks like Finagle written in Scala that are used at Twitter. And this is kind of all based on features under the hood, but it's got a lot of nice abstractions inside of it as well. And you'll also see a very similar framework called Fwangle in C++ at Facebook. This is essentially solving uh, one of the same problems that Finagle is doing, which is kind of teasing apart all of these composable abstractions at this layer. So clearly, there's a nice theme here of futures going on. And so this has kind of been our focus for looking at asynchronous I.O. and Rust is kind of diving along this futures idea and seeing how far we can take it. So if you take a look at what is a future, you'll get this kind of pretty bland uh, Wikipedia definition. But essentially, it's a placeholder for a value that might eventually become available. And all that's a fancy way of saying they have a trait that looks a lot like this where you have a successful uh, a future can resolve with an actual item. There's some error that it might happen along the way. And you just say, there, you just schedule a callback, saying at some point, run this callback with this item or the error, some result saying what's going on there. So this is kind of the core. But if you take a look at that, you might think, this looks a lot like JavaScript. So why are we just getting ourselves back into callback hell? This is the whole thing we're trying to avoid. We don't want to have in Rust itself. It's not a very good async IO story. But with futures, it's actually very different. Because futures are a placeholder for a value that is to come about, you can do a lot of really strong manipulations with that that look very ergonomic as well. So this is an example of a function which downloads some JSON from Crystal.io, parses it out, gets a field out, returns an integer, and does that all in a very compact series of lines. So this is, uh, we can imagine that there's this HTTP get function, which is kind of just pulling down a future of a response. So uh, that's the actual value returned by this. And then we get to use these things called combinators, which is very similar to result or iterator or option. And in this case, we can say, if that future was successful, the and then, we'll then run the JSON parse function over the result that we got back. And then that itself might fail, so that's kind of the and then versus a map. So here we, uh, the map here will then change the type from a future of t to a future of u, kind of change what's actually going to be resolved. And we'll say, from that giant JSON blob, we'll pull this out. And then finally, we'll try and parse that as a string once we go along to the very end. So there's quite a bit happening here in this very dense period of code. And I wanted to highlight kind of the combinator style of this makes it uh, essentially synchronous. You're not actually, there's not all, it's very difficult to tell that all of this is happening asynchronously. Once you return from this function, the data might actually already be there by the time you uh, actually return, but it might also just be in flight and it'll uh, come about at a later date. And then also, uh, the, the composability of futures really shows here where the and then is saying, I'm waiting for one future to finish, and then I'm going to execute an entirely separate future, but I only really care about the very end when it all finishes, so we kind of delay that resolution until all the work has actually happened. And then finally, a very common thing when you're doing I.O. is to kind of propagate errors as much as possible. So once you hit an error, you just punt it up the stack and you say, all right, someone else handle that error, but I will continue no more. There's nothing else for me to do because an error has happened. So there's actually not a lot of error handling here, and the reason is that it's all happening implicitly. This and then, this map, are only running in the successful case. So once this HTTP get fails, it'll actually just skip all future code and just plumb it all the way through, and the error will kind of naturally go through. And not only that, 
but the and then means that the future, the future future is then allowed to fail. So the JSON parse could fail, the parsing into a string from or parsing a string into an integer could also fail. But all along the way, this error is kind of plumbed through and you don't have to worry about explicitly doing so. So this is kind of showing that this isn't callback hell. We don't have to worry about this kind of uh, problem from, from JavaScript. The futures which are implemented as promises in JavaScript are a much more promising way to do asynchronous I.O. much more ergonomically. But, but where does just, I'm complete Rust newbie, where does that error, like you get a 404 on that. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't return a result or anything like that, so there's no okay, the, the, the future. What does num downloads return in case of? It never error? actually runs. So the type, of, uh, the type of the future of the HTTP get is a future of response. And then the type of uh, the JSON parse is a future of a JSON blob. And then the type of a parse of the num downloads is a future of the string from the num downloads and then a future of integer finally afterwards. So each of those is kind of showing what the type that's going to be resolved will keep going. And you actually just skip all the code if it is an error case because you don't have an object of that value to kind of actually run that. So if the HTTP get fails, the JSON parse is never called because there's no JSON to actually hand it. Right, but I'm calling them downloads at one point, right? And I'm expecting some sort of result back. But what, what is it that I would actually get would be back? Future error with some error. Okay. I think, uh, do you mean like from this function itself? Yeah, how would I, how, how, oh, what, what right. would the I mean, I still need to handle an error at some point, right? right. What would that error handling look like? So it's actually, uh, there, the combinators kind of allow you in many ways to do things. So for example, and then is saying from a successful result, return a future. But there's also a combinator called then, which means given a future, like given the result of the resolved future, then do something else and return a new future. So there you can like explicitly say, I'm handling both the successful and the error result. You can also do things like map error, or you can change the error back up. But there are a lot of combinators that say, run this action on the uh, feature itself, kind of on the error when it happens. So you don't always, uh, you, it's, you never ignore it. You always kind of explicitly do say at some point along the line. And then this very thin shim, once you get to the very end, where you actually want to wait for the value of the feature, is uh, kind of, it depends on the library that you're actually using at that point. So you might be tied to Mio, you might be tied to some thread pool, you might be tied to some other async IO library, but that's kind of, that's where it essentially defines saying, you'll get the result from that, you can, can then match on it after that. Does that make sense? No, but that's me, and uh, we can, we can, you can probably explain me. afterwards. Uh, Come talk to me afterwards. Oh, uh, yeah. Just wondering, um, I read something about C++ and there's a wait, something like that, and I think they tried to solve the same problem and it's like, as far as I understand it, it looks nicer because then you don't need all these combinators, I think you said, but you just write a wait and then after that you can continue your like writing normal Right, stuff. the problem with await is that it's blocking. Once you call await, you actually wait for the result of the future to go together. So one of the main purposes of futures is to kind of uh, compose asynchronous I.O. So you kind of fire off a socket request, first you fire off a read, and then you wait for either one to finish. If you wait for either one to finish at that point in time, you can't execute the other one. So once you, uh, calling await is essentially translating this back to synchronous code. I thought they return a future, and then later, if, for example, here is a um, had it be uh, finished, then it continues, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. So I thought it's, it's an asynchronous. I think in most async await implementations, you can also call await on an array of futures. So right. you could deal with it that way. There, it's essentially kind of degenerate to a number of combinators where if you have various ways you're manipulating these futures or you're kind of uh, w doing something once the value is there, or doing something once an array of values is there, it kind of all fits in the future abstraction where that's, a future is always a placeholder for something that's later to come. So if you do it await, but it kind of just gives, does it within a block and kind of run that, that's kind of the map combinator, maybe the then combinator, depending on what you're actually doing. Does that make sense? Um, my English is too. <laughs> come talk to me afterwards and I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can explain a little more. So, uh, Kind of going over what futures look like in Rust, there's a couple of uh, interesting pieces that come out. And one is that ownership is really, really important. Ownership is a crux of Rust itself, and it really shows in the futures implementation. So if you find futures in most other languages, then it turns out they resolve to a value, but then you can access this value at any time. So it's kind of permanently resolved to that one value. 
But in Rust, we don't want we want to pass through ownership of this value that's actually been created. So we want to kind of make sure it keeps going. And that means that you can actually only run this callback once. And that has a lot of interesting implications for the API itself. But as a trait, we can make sure we always have zero cost iterators. We don't have this extra layer of indirection, extra layer, extra allocation sitting in the middle. We can make sure that you implement the future as efficiently as possible as you see for your one little tiny construct. And then you get all these nice combinators, you get all this nice composability with other actions, and you get that all for free. This is very similar to the iterator trait where you have very similar ergonomics in terms of uh, combining futures together, combining iterators together, uh, running all these callbacks and doing fancy things to that. But the other final thing that we've seen is that in other libraries, you'll see that cancellation is a very core value of any field of futures library. This kind of comes out where it's like you fire off a request, but you don't actually end up needing the response. Something dynamically tells you, you don't want to wait for that. You don't want to, you just kind of want to prevent it from executing any more work because you're done with that. And in Rust, this really shows up in the combinators kind of, uh, so for example, this is a with select, where here we're, uh, taking a socket off of a listener, so we're kind of accepting a connection. We're then gonna run our uh, process function, so we're gonna map it over whatever's gonna actually go and run the request. And at the same time, we're gonna create a timer, which is going to fire in a thousand milliseconds or a second. And then we're going to create this, we're gonna use the select combinator to say, I want to wait for either the socket or the timeout to fire. So I'm basically saying, what, I'm waiting at most one second to accept a connection, fully process it and be done, and then uh, we'll see what happens like, with this event loop that actually await for the value. And one of the key things here is that if the timeout fires, you don't want to actually select a socket. You don't want to actually go and continue processing information. You don't want to have all this happen behind the scenes because you'll never get the value back. You'll never want it again. You've, the timeout has already fired. So cancellation is a great way to express this and it's kind of a key, it's showing how, because this is a, in a combinator, it's a very key part of the trade itself. And one of the coolest things about Rust is that we already have this ability of deterministic destruction. We kind of semi-linear types. So we actually express cancellation purely through drop. Once you don't need a value of a future, you just let it go out of scope, you just forget about it, and it goes away. And this is a really powerful way to say uh, we no longer are using this feature because it kind of prevents a lot of bugs statically. You can't ever use a canceled future because by definition, you don't have access to a canceled future at that point. So, Select can uh, join is another combinator which uses this, take advantage of this quite a bit to make sure that you get the right semantics when kind of select the first thing fires or in join one thing fires but it was an error then you're definitely not going to need the other one so you cancel it off. And then one of the key parts this actually gets implemented at is the and then combinator. So if the first feature is canceled, you definitely don't want to run the second feature. You don't want to have this whole chain of features get fired when they've been canceled along the way. So you'll see that uh, certainly when once you start uh, working with features and in, and so the vision that we're seeing for futures is at this very bottom layer, we have Mio, which is the library to build async IO on top of. We might also have some thread pools, but these are very low level. You might not want to actually use them directly. They tend to be uh, very difficult to use, unergonomic, but they're very fast. That's kind of what they're intended to be. But on top of this, we'll see a bunch of other libraries such as coroutine or, or coroutines like with MioCo or eventual with futures. And they might even be somewhat built on top of each other depending on how it actually shakes out. But this is an extra layer abstraction on top of the Mio and Threadpool worlds. This is kind of the more ergonomic which you might actually want to consider using. But if you want the maximum performance, you'll still have to go directly down to the Mio layer. And then on top of this, we might see the finagle.rs library, kind of the port of finagle and Scala over to Rust, or kind of the port of Wangle in, in Rust. And that's largely all going to be based on futures uh, so far. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of see how that plays out. And finally, we'll get, see the applications we built on top of all of this. So you'll have applications that are built on coroutines. You'll have applications that are built on finagle, or they might be built on eventual directly, or they might somehow blend the two of these. But the key thing here is there, uh, we have this layering scheme where features are not the end-all be-all of async IO and Rust. We have all these layers that are useful to everyone in their own right. So we have this whole stack we need to develop and this whole stack we need to work on. And especially this finagle and eventual portion, it's going to require a lot of community consensus. The idea of an abstraction of futures is a cross-cutting concept among, uh, between all libraries in Rust that want to actually use this. So it's going to require a lot of iteration, a lot of uh, discussion to kind of see what exactly this needs to look like, what are the very precise semantics in all these very uh, edging corner cases. And this is going to be a very long and ongoing discussion with the community as we continue to, de to develop these libraries.
All right, so finally, I want to talk about uh, some of the events we have upcoming in 2016. That was kind of a, w w what's been happening and what's going to happen directly. But the first up, we have a lot of conferences going on. In 2015, we had one conference at Rust Camp over in Berkeley uh, in California. But now this year, we have three separate conferences in Portland, in Berlin uh, over here, and in Pittsburgh itself. So I would highly recommend, uh, if you're interested in going to any of these conferences, feel free to submit a talk to them or just sign up for them. I think a couple of them have, have not all of them have tickets on sale yet, but they'll be coming on soon. And I, I, it's certainly going to be a blast, and I'm, going to, I'm going, personally going to go as many of them as, as I possibly can. And then to give you a, a quick overview, uh, we had 1.9 released in May, back in May on the 26th, a few weeks ago. And this one majorly included the stabilization of the stood, stood panic module, the, what I was talking about earlier. And finally, we'll have 1.10 released pretty soon, which has a lot of new features, such as panicky with support, this idea of panic hooks, which say that you can uh, configure what actually happens on a panic. So instead of printing a console, printing a message to the console, you might send a log message, or you might go and do something else and do something crazy. And then finally, we have uh, Unix sockets coming to the standard library. We have a crate that they've been baked in for quite a long time, and now they're actually being supported fully in the standard library itself. And so in addition to all that, we have a ton of new features in the pipeline. I think this is not even an exhaustive list of everything that I could think of. But we have one of the major ones is incremental compilation coming down the pipeline. This is the ability to say that uh, instead of recompiling your entire library every time you recompile it, it's actually just a very tiny portion and kind of reloading information uh, that it had previously. We have non-zeroing drop is in theory a new feature, but it was actually implemented before, after I made this slide. So that's something we already have in Rust today. But other great things, I was talking about Rust up NDKs, where uh, we're going to have all this management where cross-compilation truly is push button. We have infiltrate, which is a kind of very concise way to return an iterator, to return a future, to return a closure. Uh, the RFC for that is actually becoming very close to consensus, so I suspect we'll see that make progress over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, we have uh, we plans to target WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is kind of an up and coming specification for the web itself where you can compile Rust to WebAssembly and then run that directly in your web browser. So adding to this whole story of running Rust everywhere, you're now literally running Rust in the web browser, which then gives you that whole world of portability and applications as is. Well, we'll see, we've seen a lot of progress in Rust format, which is kind of developing a standard style for Rust and automatically doing that. Things like plugins, are, we have a, a very strong story for now at this point, and we think we might actually get them roughly to the stable point. Not stable Rust, but probably still nightly, but somewhat de facto stable. And finally, some uh, a new revamp of the macro system with uh, new macro rules and kind of a, a new layer in terms of hygiene resolution, and it'll just kind of play with the rest of Rust pretty nicely. Question. I'm just seeing the bullet uh, non zeroing and drop. So, uh, a drop per, um, by default zeros out the memory? Right, this is actually a really misleading name. It's actually, what, what we did yesterday was something called filling drop, which is where I was talking about when you move a value, you pave over it with a bunch of uh, specific bit pattern. That used to actually pave over with zeros, except then someone could accidentally rely on that being zero, so we did it in arbitrary. Anyway, so now instead of non zeroing drop, we have stack flags. So this is saying, you won't actually pay over anything. We just have these really, really tiny things on the stack, like I was showing with the mirror slides. Uh, on the other side, I was missing a feature in Rust uh, where I can safely overwrite a memory by, let's say, zeros to, to clear a password I had in a, in a string variable or such. Um, are there any, uh, is there such a security feature? Not currently. You can use drop to kind of, when your value goes out of scope, you pave over it with a new value. So like specifically if you have a buffer like, like uh, that. Wouldn't this optimize by the, uh, by the compiler as the value has, uh, mm -hmm. will never be read? It certainly co could be. That's kind of a, that's an LVM thing in terms of you, have, you still have to tell okay. the optimizer. There's no guarantee. Right. Okay. It's, like, it's kind of like C and C++ where you can do it a little more ergonomically in Rust where you have an injection point where you actually can run this code. So as long as you have a way to tell the optimizer, like don't, Optimize away this right. Like we have volatile reads and writes, you can you can probably do that. But we also have the you also have the guarantee in Rust where values might be leaked, so you might not you, that destructor might not run. So it tends to be a little more sensitive, kind of a little more nuanced than that. Okay, thank you. Right, and um, so to kind of wrap this all up, a lot of the focus that we've seen before, uh, right after 1.0, is kind of the same focus now in terms of moving forward. So we're, bring, we're seeing branching out with Rust and WebAssembly, Rust and new platforms, Rust up and NDKs, all this management. We see the doubling down of infrastructure investments in terms of Mir really coming to take shape. Re Mir, which we've been working on for so long, is starting to produce a lot of its fruit. We see a lot of new optimizations, a lot of new uh, kind of uh, paradigms that you can actually write in Rust itself. 
And finally, we have the zeroing in where we're uh, developing the async I.O. ecosystem. We're developing features like specialization or features like infiltrate, kind of give closing gaps in the language which allow you to do uh, paradigms you hadn't actually been able to do before. And that's all I have for today, so thanks so much for coming. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, just a quick one on the async IO part. Uh, what is your personal take on having something like generators or, or C sharp style uh, uh, state machines in right. the language? So this is it's kind of something that we've actually planned to go to at some point. Uh, it's been thought that we can uh, take futures and kind of, this is kind of what generators are, and then eventually once we actually have generators, they themselves are all built on futures under the hood. But one of the main blockers for generators is they are very ergonomic and they're working out really well for C Sharp, but I've heard tale that uh, it's over like 70% of the Roslyn compiler is just the generator compiler. So that sort of massive investment is something we, we need to see some more returns on that a little more quickly. So the, with futures, we can kind of get there much more incrementally in terms of have these checkpoints along the way where we have a futures library, we have finagle, we have uh, libraries built on top of all those. And then once that's all flushed out, we can start considering, here's the async IO world today. This is like all working pretty solidly. Can we make it even better once we have futures on top of that? So in terms of like which is more ergonomic to use in, like I, I, I have not personally worked a whole lot with generators. So I, but I would suspect that from what I've seen, it actually ends up being a little more ergonomic in some cases because you don't have to worry about this and then or a little more closures here and there. But it's, it's mostly, a, a, because it kind of all translates to futures eventually, the ergonomics are kind of be like on the order of the same thing. So talking about futures, have you also thought about implementing observables? Because they are basically futures with multiple items spread over time. And I've looked at some crates. I think one of them is called carbon oxide or something like that. And it tries to implement observables or event streams in Rust. And it's pretty complicated. And I think it doesn't really work that well with the borrow checker. But I could see some improvements there, and I think there's a lot of opportunities to aesthetically check more of the variables beforehand. Right. This is actually currently implemented in Eventual today, is this concept of streams where you have uh, w one, one list of values that's going to be produced at various uh, points in time. That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, right. Okay. So those are all actually built on top of futures themselves. And the way they're implemented in eventual, a stream is actually just a future of the first item and then the rest, the rest of the items. So it's kind of a future of something and then itself again. And then eventually that just exhausts and you don't actually get anything back out. So this is a concept we, we've thought about. And I've also been reading about uh, this uh, concept of reactive streams, which are implemented in Java very well in terms of uh, control, uh, back pressure and dealing with uh, kind of the rates of flow throughout a system and make, making sure they're all balanced. So it's certainly on the radar. It's not. It's kind of a add-on to features. So far from what we've seen, it's certainly something that can be built on top of what we currently have today. So we're, we're thinking of flushing out the library today, kind of adding unit tests, making sure that it's uh, platform coverage, start building up some libraries on top of that, maybe even like a finagle-ish framework as we get very, very kind of just the very tip of it. And then once we start seeing that and see more use cases for streams and kind of how they apply and kind of how they interact with the rest of the system, start flushing that out as well in terms of uh, adding the abstractions for that. Right. Um, I'm really waiting for Mir because uh, I am. Um, uh, how, how do I do this track and describe? Um, I think it's an opportunity to, to try to compile Rust to other targets like uh, other intermediate language, like uh, let's say, uh, say Spear V, that's an um, intermediate language of the Kronos group that uh, can be executed on uh, hardware accelerated devices um, like um, yeah, currently OpenCL. And I think it's a great opportunity um, to try if I can compile Rust code to either run on the CPU um, or compile it with a different target like a spare V to, um, to be executed on a hardware accelerate uh, computer. Uh, would, uh, would, would Mir be a good candidate for this? Yeah, Mir would be fantastic, actually. The WebAssembly support that I was talking about is actually being prototyped as a direct Mir to WebAssembly translator. There's actually no LLVM in between. 
there's actually, there's even, there's been Rust's efforts to run Rust on the GPU in the past, but they've largely been through kind of LVM plugins or various LVM targets and kind of like you write a very small subset of Rust that doesn't have access to a lot of things. But I think I can see that totally happening. I think uh, we're not planning on stabilizing the mirror representation, like that any sort of texture representation or in-memory representation. So it would probably re be restricted to Netly for a while, but for things like uh, WebAssembly, this is probably the vector that we're going to take for the initial implementation. Would be great. Yeah. And uh, the question about Mir earlier, um, there is a, actually a proposal to turn Mir on for Nightly literally right now. And there's been there's some discussion going on to turn it on by default or not. And we're going to kind of see how that plays out. But it's, it's definitely very ready. We, the non-zeroing drop was one of the final performance uh, improvements to kind of get it back up to par with old trends. And now that we're at that point, we can just keep on moving it forward. Uh, what about the uh, documentation about Mir? The current uh, documentation is quite stale and uh, lots of links are, uh, not the documentation, the announcement, and lots of the links don't work anymore. In terms and of, uh, where was this again? Um, was this the blog post? There, one, there was a blog post mentioning it on, uh, on a few months ago. And uh, some of the links don't work anymore. And I was trying to get into Mir and it's, it's hard to find any information I from my taste. So I, I haven't personally worked too much on Mirror itself, but I, I, for the few times that I have glanced at it in the code itself, it's actually very well documented and it's pretty clear. Like if you've uh, if you've got a lot of experience, if you've had any experience with compiler IRs or various things here and there, mm -hmm. it'll be very natural. It kind of flows very readably. You can kind of look at the data structures. Directly. So the source is the best source. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned in the in the embedding Rust thing, uh, you mentioned that there's zero runtime. And yes. it sounds a bit too good to be true, uh, because there's obviously something that needs to be done. Um, can, you, can you tell a bit about this? Like, like are you, well, just generating uh, boilerplate, or is it, is it moved to the runtime bit? Because, well, say, well, you mentioned the stack unwinding part, but maybe global scope, initialization, and teardown, something like that. How, how is it done, then, if it's not in the runtime? The notion of, so it's kind of a loaded, loaded thing when I say runtime is it kind of depends on who you talk to is how they actually define it. So if you consider C having a runtime, then we definitely have a runtime. If you consider Java a threshold for having a runtime, we definitely don't have a runtime. Like we don't have a garbage collector. But essentially, we, there are some, there's some global state, there is some initialization that we kind of need to run, but most of, all of it can run lazily. So you're not required to initialize anything. In Rust, we don't have uh, global constructors or global destructors. We have essentially no life before or after main. So in all, in all these cases, we don't actually have to deal with that because we don't have that. But uh, the very small pieces of state here and there, like we have, I think, the arguments that you pull off from the command line need to be initialized somehow, and maybe a few other tiny things. But it ends up being that we just don't provide the abstractions for doing, for doing this. And the unwinder is just a library that reads metadata written by the compiler. We have an allocator, but who doesn't? things like that well, I'm, 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 uh, well my, my, my domain is, is well going embedded very small systems and I, I, I'm interested in going how, like how small can this footprint be made so we actually uh, in terms of how low down you can actually get there's a uh, there's kind of two ish standard libraries in rust there's the standard like the stood the standard library but then there's a very small subset of that called core the core of the standard library, but uh, it's truly is a subset in terms of the standard library just literally re-exports everything. But this small subset assumes not; it doesn't even have an allocator. So this is kind of the core bare metal of Rust, where you literally can run it anywhere. So we've seen a lot of kernels written on top of libcore. We've seen a lot of uh, very bare metal projects written directly on top of libcore, and that's where uh, you assume you only can do like addition or subtraction or memory moves and memory copies, and that's kind of that's kind of what you would expect from C with no runtime. But it's giving you all the idioms of Rust. You still have match, you have results, you have options. You, you can panic, but it's up to the actual user who then actually writes it to implement that. Yeah. So, sort of in that, in that, in that same vein, uh, and on the first slide, I think you said 18 targets, and then it was 30, and then it was like, oh, yes. kind of everything that LLVM supports. And, um, but yeah, I don't know. It just seems like everything that LLVM supports. How many how many targets are truly supported that somebody really cares for them? Because everybody does like vax deck, but nobody actually like. Right. It's like so actually, to do, but nobody really supports it. I forgot to mention this, so thank you for reminding me. But we have a notion of tier one, two, and three platforms, where the guarantees that we provide tier one tests and builds, tier two builds, tier three is someone tried it at some point it worked. So we have eight. Tier 1 targets, the Windows, Mac, Linux, 32 and 64, and on Windows we have MSVC and MinGW. 
for tier two car for tier two targets, we're actually this means that we're we are, we ourselves are producing binaries for these targets. We're not running tests mostly because we don't have the hardware to actually run the tests. Those include targets like Android and Muscle, which we actually do run tests for, but it's kind of not fully up to par with everything else. And then once you get beyond that, you have like ARM Linux, PowerPC Linux, AR64 Linux, uh, iOS. These are all building, so we make sure that, uh, like in Rust, you kind of have the guarantee that if like the target on other platforms runs all tests, it'll probably run all tests, but not the major guarantees. So essentially, if you want something that literally everyone's using, it's tier one targets, and we have eight of those. And those are like, MSVC is the only one that we've added since uh, 1.0 was released. And Android and Muscle, which is the static libc, are the closest to next becoming a tier one target. All right, thanks so much for your time. Yeah.